Hi there, everyone. Welcome to episode number 547 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Are you ready to head to ITF world? It's Belgium or bust, baby. <laughs> My guest is Joe Dubuque from IMEC, and we're talking about one of the hottest topics at this year's ITF world, autonomous driving. Joe and I discuss the biggest challenges surrounding perception in autonomous driving, why there is a need for new compute paradigms in this arena, and how IMEC is strengthening technology ecosystems through system technology co-optimization. All right, so without further ado, please welcome Joe to Fish Fry. Hi, Joe. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to be here. So for my audience who may not know, what is ITF World all about? And Joe, what kind of topics were covered at this year's conference? ITF World is IMIC Technology Forum, and it's the one where we have assembled and we assemble this annually, the ecosystem of semiconductor technology and applications. And it's uh, IMIC's prime event. It's our flagship event on semiconductor advances, and it really centers around semiconductor technology, system scaling, its applications, but it has a wide focus on those applications as well as larger companies, startups, demos. So it's really a fun place to be. Excellent. Now, at this year's ITF World, there was a presentation called Autonomous Driving Automotive ADAS Needs Exceptional Perception and New Compute Paradigms. So first, Joe, let's talk about exceptional perception. So what do you mean by that? And what are the biggest challenges to achieve that? Yeah, indeed. So it's a mouthful, right? I mean, we drive a car, most of us, and we are challenged often by situations on the road that are either rapidly varying or surprising coming from left or right or from the rear of the car, light conditions or weather conditions. So if you look at our limitations, as we all experience them, Weather and light is an important one, as I mentioned. Distance, velocity of something that's uh, around the car. These are two. The other one is field of view, right? We have a field of view, which is really nice, but it's not total. It's not 360. And then, of course, resolution and depth that may vary. And, and it's also very individually varying from driver to driver. The car needs to be you know, aware of all of these things. It needs to drive in bad weather conditions. It needs to drive with uh, headlight coming in and maybe blinding some of the view. It needs to be able to you know, measure and also anticipate on objects that have different distances and, and velocity. And it needs, as I said, to view around the car. And then, of course, even if it's a distant object or it's an unclear object, the resolution needs to be always at the level that the car or yourself need to be able to make a decision. So we all understand this very easily. We call it, of course, you know, superhuman perception because the car can do this if we equip it with the right, I would say, instruments and brain. Absolutely. Now, let's also talk about those new compute paradigms. This not only includes integration paradigms, but also packaging and standardization, right? Yeah, that is true. And so before we go there, maybe if we take the car as an example for going to these compute paradigms, a computer or any decision-making process needs inputs. And for what we just talked about on the car, if you think about the human brain making the decisions and you compare it to what the car can do, maybe the perception is better because it has a shortwave infrared imagers or it has 140 gig radar coming up or a LIDAR, which is integrated in a single chip. All of these Sensors, imagers, cameras provide input that if we treat it well and if we can fuse this input, we can make decisions more powerful than the human can be can make. And that is something that requires different types of compute. You can imagine that if a sensor spots something, say, on the front of the car, maybe there isn't time to really process that information in the cloud or in a slow computer. You need to really have fast thinking processes, maybe even on the sensor. So what we see today is that in this distributed compute arena that 
the automotive is currently going towards, you need in the car or even in the sensor some early decision making or some early evidence that then these sensors share with each other. Because each and every sensor is limited in its own right. And if you then combine these different sensing options or sensing paradigms, you can fuse that into a very early precision decision making, even at the edge of the car. But in many cases, what you will do is you bring the data or the pre-processed data to the central compute. Now, before you do this, and you want to do this in the sensor, you may need some sort of neuromorphic decision support, something which functions closer like the brain does, based on spikes or based on specific lookups that you have presented or prepared for the decision making. If you bring it to the central compute of the car, there you'll have maybe 100 gigabits per second or a 1,000 teraops processing need if you want to do the inference, the fusing, and the planning of the decision-making that the car needs to do based on all of its perceptions. I use the car as an example here to just show that on the sensor, something brain-like needs to happen. Then through the spinal cord of the car goes to the central compute system that needs to be extremely performant in the, in the future. And then again, it goes to the cloud to upload maybe new experiences the car has received to then share it later in the common learning of all of the automotive systems and participants in, in traffic and mobility. So that needs to be a scalable system. That needs to be something which is very fastly developed. It has to reduce its time to market. And it has to be, of course, at automotive quality and reliability and safety. So in order to do this, and we saw this with the disrupted uh, supply chain not too long ago, the whole ecosystem around the car with all of its suppliers needs to adapt. This is one way of looking at a new paradigm of computing. It's the distributed fashion of this, where you will need that flexibility, that uh, novelty to be included in the full stack. And so that is very challenging. Quite a few speakers at the ITF addressed that topic. IMEC is working on that part, for instance, on driving standardization towards the automotive engine, and that now I mean compute engine. And for instance, the chiplet revolution that we see there, where you have more flexible, shorter time to market you know, requirements that are answered, that standardization is, is becoming quite important. And at ITF, IMEC launched its uh, standardization effort in the ecosystem where you know car vendors, uh, OEMs, but also foundries. IDMs that prepare specific sensor or microprocessor chips today, but need to move into this new world of distributed computing, all put their heads around the challenge of, you know, coming up with the right standards and infusing the specifications for packaging, as you mentioned, but also the computes and the sensors that need to be plugged in if you want to play in this market. So that's one example of this type of compute paradigm. If you allow, right, there's two others, of course, high-performance compute. We had AMD and, of course, the foundries that are pushing the limits, as well as ASML and many of our supplier partners that are continue to push the limit on scaling of transistors and memory components. And, of course, with that, the, the whole interconnect that you have on a chip, but also there to drive to a more system-on-chip approach and stacking and using the backside of the wafer, all of these technology challenges or opportunities better, options are brought to the design table soon. EDA tool vendors and the systems companies need to get used to these new technologies. And to sum it up as, or to actually close on the paradigms, if you want, there's also the quantum computing. Quantum computing is still a promise in, in many ways. It still needs a lot of technology and algorithmic development. But we see also there that there is an ecosystem building that actually does what the earlier examples given do connect the use and the use need to this new form of computing. Fantastic. Now, Joe, you addressed it a little bit, but what is IMEC working on in this arena? I would be challenged to explain everything we do in this arena. The easiest thing would be to say all of the above. So if I need to answer your question, where does IMEC uh, work on? We want to really bring together the ecosystem. And I think that's our strength. We do, of course, push the limits of technology. And we are known as the place where technology is born in partnership with the industry. And we look at pre-competitive challenges, places where the industry throughout the stack from materials, equipment, foundries and IDMs to the design and design enablement companies to the final users, be it in healthcare, life sciences or automotive, high-performance compute, you name it. 
And so the strength of that ecosystem is exactly where IMEC focuses. We deliver new results in partnership with all of our partners. We give them the insight in future technologies and how that changes potentially the way that they will design their system or provide services. And it's what we call system technology co-optimization. And again, that's also a mouthful. But that SDCO, system technology co-optimization, really points to the fact that in the current generations of technology, in the current generations of applications, they need to come together because they will influence each other. And it's not a technology push or market pool only. It's really that intricate connection between understanding the specs, knowing the user needs, bringing them to the fab or the lab, and introducing new components, even new materials that will be required to answer to those specs. So that is why it's a fun place. It's, it's this arena where all of this comes together. And IMIC positions itself and organizes its programs and roadmaps such that the industry gets most out of that forward-looking part, the pre-competitive arena, as I mentioned, but also then can go hand-in-hand hand with this new technology to where they differentiate in the market, which is then, of course, another way of doing innovation within the same ecosystem. That makes sense. Now, Joe, let's talk about sustainability. Now, that was an overall theme for this year's ITF world, right? That's correct. And it will be there for a while, I think, in terms of top priority. Sustainability has many scopes, right? And I'm sure your listeners know. But of course, first and foremost, you have to look at what the impact is of what you do yourself and how your supply chain is acting on improvements for sustainability, zero emission and low carbon footprint or zero carbon footprint, even if you can uh, can get there in the decades to come. And so that will require a fundamental understanding, first and foremost, of the processes, the flows, whatever we do to manufacture our technology. And IMEC has built a program around that that immediately got quite a bit of uh, support and attention and partnership from the industry players because they know they all rely on each other to make the full chain zero CO2, zero emission. And so we have built a model, the IMEC Net Zero model, that's actually also to be found on the internet in its elementary version, where you can screen technology modules and flows to understand what the impact is and how, when you adapt certain processes, you can make changes to the sustainability score, if you want. And so that is, first and foremost, the first thing that needs to happen is getting a full understanding, getting a view of the digital factory or foundry that's behind your technology and see what the footprint is there. Of course, that will require often new materials and materials replacement, which is you know currently once in a while in the news that we need to drive to making sure that the whole process, including materials, material sourcing and materials recycling is a complete and a full cycle. And so also there as an element of that research program, we're trying to elaborate where the opportunities are to replace, to reuse, to recycle. And then, of course, in the application and in the full supply chain, how that is connected, there are still challenges. And so sustainability in that sense is also trying to think of how to bring the most efficient use of this technology to bear, how to steer, guide, potentially also the algorithms to use and the services to lower its footprint which is, of course, even a broader set of challenges. What we can do, we need to do best and first, is to look at the, the impact of our own process technology there. And that's where many companies have signed up, as I mentioned. And basically, if you look at any CEO presentation, and we had quite a few from NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, Applied Materials, Samsung, Bosch Infineon, KLA, Volkswagen, etc. ASML, of course, you know, they all look at the sustainability as one of their prime drivers in their mission statement when they start their presentation or when they conclude. So, well, first of all, you shouldn't avoid it, but you also can't avoid the topic. And also during, you know, the breaks and dinners, there is ample talk about how to partner and how to build, you know, the corporate and ecosystem responsibility towards uh, sustainability. That's fantastic. So, Joe, there were a lot of different topics at this year's ITF world, but if you had to have one favorite part what would it be? Oh boy, I'm going to avoid that question by answering the demo floor. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? You know, that's where the energy is. You know, there's a whole demo floor of 50 plus demos and it goes from, you know, topics like biomanufacturing, agri-food, health, digital twins, hyperspectral imaging, you know, all of these connected to the challenges that, that I brought earlier. 
The good thing is there, you see, first of all, real demos. You can see how the technology really, you know, showing off the system's impact. It also shows the energy of the researchers. If, it, if anything, it's still a people's business, right? You need to enthuse people to, to work on this topic. And no better way to do that than to show and show off. And, and one important area close to my heart is the venturing part, the startups. They're demoing their first prototypes or even their second generation prototypes. That you see how they came out of the lab, in many cases, our own lab, moving through manufacturing, often using our own technology and our technology uh, fab here to move to manufacturing. And so that whole journey of bringing something of a bright idea in a, in a lab somewhere to try to make impact is where venturing and startups are very, very much key. I promised I avoid your question by, by saying the demo floor, but it was really the place to be. It's also where our networking happens and where a lot of, I'm sure, also deals are being closed by connecting you know, different players in the network. So if you want to get energy after sitting down in that beautiful hall with 2,000 people listening to talks, you can go to the demo floor and you get boosted. I love it. And that's an absolutely okay answer. Well, Joe, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. It's a privilege as well. Thank you so much. If you would like even more information about ITF World or any of the super cool projects that IMEC is working on, I would encourage you to check out this week's Fish Frying page on eejournal.com or this week's episode on YouTube as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash EE Journal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of September 1st, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>